milk, and more milk. Eight pounds of milk to make a single pound of cheese. That's four quarts of milk. Land O'Lakes, four quart American. Four quart cheddar. Rich, full, creaminess you can taste. Four quarts of milk go into every pound. Four quarts. But what would you expect from Land O'Lakes? Transurance for automobiles from Transamerica now covers an insured vehicle while being used in a carpool. Let your local Transamerica agent show you Transurance for automobiles, the key to broader protection for your family and your car. Transamerica Insurance, first-rate service at a fair price. Contact a Hebner Cavanaugh Night Agency with offices in both downtown Toledo and Rossford. And call Clifford P. Fox and Son, independent insurance agent in West Toledo at 473-3017. Woodville Appliances is holding a giant in-store warehouse sale. This Litton microwave oven with very quick control, just $269. Save $30 on this Litton microwave oven now at Woodville Appliances. 13 strong, stronger every day. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. If you've been watching us across the country all week, you know that this is the week from which we are originating. Uh, in an effort to uh, expose America to those of you who haven't had this opportunity, and you ought to take advantage of it, of seeing as varied a uh, landscape as there is anywhere in the world, I greet you from Salt Lake City, Utah. And on, uh, uh, as we as we tape, President Reagan has not announced the specific details of his plan to develop and deploy the MX missile system. But I don't have to tell conscientious Americans everywhere that uh, the folks in this state are in the center of this controversy since uh, the original basing plan had the holes in the ground for MX, both in the state of Nevada as well as this state of Utah. Since that time, the Mormon Church, among a number of other institutions, has come out against that particular geography for the basing plan. And so uh, President Reagan has a lap full of controversy, and uh, what we've done is taken a survey of this audience to determine how you feel about having the MX in your state. I'll reveal the results of that survey in just a moment. There are approximately 3,000 people here, most of whom, not all, but most of whom are Utahns, and we'll find out how you feel in just a moment. On this program, we intend not only to examine the, the issue of the MX and military hardware, but also the issue of military personnel as well, with emphasis on the possibility of a peacetime draft. Is the volunteer army working? Would America, would America tolerate a draft in peacetime? Who would be exempt? Under what circumstances? And uh, how much would it cost? And is it good for us? These are just some of the questions we'll ask today. Now, to prepare you for this discussion, let me share with you some statistics and some ideas prior to the introduction of our guests. First, how much does a recruit who is married make upon his entrance into the military? Any guesses? How much a month? How much? 450? 300? 800? Here's the answer to that question. A new recruit with the rank of E1 who is married and living off base receives a monthly taxable salary of $501.30. He also receives a non-taxable housing allowance of $179.70, as well as a non-taxable food allowance of $118.20. For a total monthly income for the, this is the lowest rank, married person living off base, $799.20. Now for those recruits who are not married, the pay as of 1980 for a new recruit with the rank of E1, unmarried and living on base, was $501 monthly taxable allowance with no allowance for housing, no allowance for food. So if you're single, if you're 18, or if you're in that 
age bracket and you join up as the commercials encourage you to do you will receive five hundred and one dollars and thirty cents a month taxable uh, salary now from a book titled national defense which was written by james fallows who happens to be a phi beta kappa graduate of harvard and a Rhodes scholar as well he's the former speechwriter for jimmy carter who who resigned with the observation that he had some misgivings about the will of president carter to take hold and make some of the more politically unpopular decisions that it was Mr. Fallow's view had to be addressed. He, uh, he is also a former Nader Raider, and he, you should also know that he's a man who, uh, during the Vietnam War controversy, was at draft age and resisted the draft, refused to be drafted, and joined the growing army of protesters against that war. You're certainly free to question him about that. Here from his book titled National Defense are some observations which I'd like you to consider. You can see them on your screen over here. In 1964, Fallows tells us in his book, the last year of the pre-Vietnam draft, 17% of all draftees had some college education, as did 14% of those who enlisted. That's 64. In 1979, 3% of the men who joined the volunteer army had ever been to college. Also from Fallow's book, in 1964, slightly more than 25% of all draftees were high school dropouts. In 1979, 41% of the men who joined the volunteer army had not finished high school. Say again, in 1979, 41% of the men who joined the volunteer army had not finished high school. Next graphic. In 1980, of the 100,860 men who were serving their first term as enlisted men in the combat arms of the Army Infantry Armor Artillery, the ones who fight, how many possess degrees from any college of any quality? Now, let me give you the question again. In 1980, there were about 100,000 men who were, these are, the, these are the people who are ready to fight, the people who will go to war immediately should that emergency develop. How many of them have degrees from any college of any quality anywhere in the United States? Twenty-five. Not twenty-five percent, but twenty-five people. Now, Mr. Fallows will tell you in a moment that that has been, that figure has been revised by the Pentagon itself. And my understanding is now we have, according to the Pentagon claim, about a thousand. So of one hundred thousand men ready to go, only a thousand, according to the latest statistics, as Mr. Fallows will explain, have been to college. One more item here. There are nearly twice as many graduates on any 45-man team in the National Football League. In the entire army of the 340,000 enlisted men who in 1980 were serving their first term, a total of 276 had college degrees. All right, now remember, this, these, these are important statistics because we have a, uh, apparently a, a good deal of support for the investment of $1.5 trillion in the military over the next five years. Obviously, the questions that these statistics or uh, observations r raise, will we have a lot of sophisticated black boxes that may or may not work? And what is the uh, education of the people who we are asking to man this equipment under the terms of the voluntary enlistment program that's currently underway in this country? I'm almost finished. Next, next graphic. Despite the predictions of the Gates Commission, the military grows steadily more black. If current trends continue, by the mid-80s, more than half of the soldiers in ranks E1 through E3 in the Army, the true grunts, will be blacks or Hispanics. Also interesting is that 65% of blacks who join as Army enlisted men have high school diplomas versus 54% of whites. Putting it another way, the blacks in the uh, minorities in the army today are more educated than the whites. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is how you who live in the state of Utah, in advance of the president's announcement on the specifics of the basing of the most important military piece of hardware in the history of this country with estimates of cost ranging up to $100 billion, have voted. Here was our question. As you entered, we asked you to answer this question. If President Reagan decides to locate the MX missile system in Utah, we asked you to vote will, whether you'll object or whether you will not object. And here are the results. 1,875 of you objected. 
950 of you did not object. We'll meet our guests here in Salt Lake City in just a moment, and we hope you'll join us. Hamburger tastes this good. Hamburger helper. Help the hamburger. Mm -hmm. Hamburger helper, help the hamburger helper. Make a great meal. Hamburger helper helps her make a great meal. Like our cheeseburger macaroni. Just add it to hamburger and make a saucy, savory supper from hearty elbow macaroni and tangy cheddar cheese. Kids gonna love it. Mm -hmm. Dad will too. Mm -hmm. Hamburger helper, help the hamburger helper. Make a great meal. You seem to go much better When you share your day together Maxwell House and you Here's important news for everyone who will buy carpet before February 1st, 1982. During our manufacturer's cooperative carpet sale, Riggles will save you 20 to 40 percent off America's favorite carpets. That's right. We've made special arrangements with not one, not four, but nine leading mills. Take immediate delivery or a small deposit will hold your order at these special prices until February 1st. But you must act now. Come to Riggles, 6925 West Central, now during our manufacturer's cooperative carpet sale. Join the wall covering extravaganza going on now at the Wallpaper Gallery. Every wallpaper in stock is sale price from 25 to 40 percent off now at both Wallpaper Gallery stores. Get 35 percent off all window treatments. Wallpaper Gallery has a tremendous selection. And you'll love the fantastic book library with a big 25 percent discount on all book orders. The Wallpaper Gallery, Westgate Meadows across from Cricket West and Brownstone Plaza next to Bill Knapps. Uh, let me introduce, for those of you watching on uh, television, uh, our guests for the day. In the lighter suit is James Fallows, author of National Defense. Uh, I've already established a Harvard grad, a Rhodes Scholar, a D Vietnam War or draft resistor, and Washington editor of the Atlantic Monthly, Monthly author of National Defense, a book which received a lot of attention a very insightful and rather thorough review of where we are militarily in this country. Uh, yes, it is not lost on Mr. Fallows, the seeming contradiction of resisting his own uh, call to duty in Vietnam and now stepping forward in his early 30s, I think, to suggest that what we need is a draft. We'll give him a chance to make his point in a moment. He is in the company of Lawrence Corb, PhD, Dr. Corb is Assistant Secretary of Defense for Manpower, Reserve Affairs and Logistics. He's the man who is in charge of, uh, who must preside over the United States military force, its recruitment, its effectiveness, and uh, also its readiness. Uh, let's give you the first shot here, Dr. Korb. Uh, those are rather indicting uh, statistics we had there at the beginning of this program. Um, it looks like uh, there's increasing anxiety among the American community that our military forces are somehow not as educated as we have hoped they would be, and that your programs are more likely to recruit the young man who is fed up with high school than the young man who brings a passionate, patriotic sense of obligation to his uh, military service. Would you kindly speak to those questions? Yeah, I, I think the first point that needs to be made is uh, all of those figures and numbers that you saw in the beginning are outdated. I've written a couple of books myself, and I know what it is when you're dealing with data and then you've got to go through the publishing process, you're using information that's one or two years old. And if you take a look <clears throat> at where we are right now, we're just finishing up what we call fiscal year 1981 that, that ends in September of this year. And we have had 
the best recruiting year that we ever had. <clears throat> we have taken in higher quality people than we took in even under conscription. You saw a lot of figures about high school graduates. Last year, the Army took in 75% high school graduates, which was higher than they took in under conscription, higher than before the war in Vietnam, higher just about at any time during the year uh, since the end of World War II. Now, the figures that Jim was using in his book, we were not surprised with that because we started on a, a volunteer military concept and we undermined it. We refused to pay the people. Two years ago, I wrote a book and, and pointed out that 20,000 of our military people were on food stamps. When you have a situation like that, it's not surprising that you don't get the, the best people in society. On so, the issue of the color of the military services, it's a difficult point to make without having it have some sort of racist overtone. So let's get this in again. A disproportionate number of the people serving in the military armed services are people of color, and we've already established compliments of Mr. Fallow's research, that they are apparently better educated than are the whites. That's not as important as is the following question. Is it realistic to expect, to expect young men of minority who've seen the discrimination and the pressure on their own parents, who've seen the failure as they perceive it of the government to speak to the social needs of their own communities, to go out there and fall on the sword in behalf of a country that really is being run by people who never talk to them, who make a lot of money because of the continued survival of this country, and uh, we already saw the resentment that developed in Vietnam, and it looks like we're setting ourselves up for the same kind of punch in the nose from the minority community who will sooner or later say, I'm not going to risk my life for Texaco. Well, I... I think your point is somewhat inconsistent. The figures that you showed here in the beginning said we had too many blacks who wanted to come into the military. I think it's a reverse indictment. I think what it, it is, it shows that the, 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 the military people, I mean that black people find the military a very congenial atmosphere. We have a large percentage, <coughs> we have overall about 22% of the people in the armed forces today are blacks. The nationwide population of which we draw, if we had completely represented, would be about 14%. So we have eight percentage points more than we would. We only have 4% Hispanics. Uh, if we, we had a perfectly representative force, we'd have 6%. The reason that we have this large number of blacks is not only because they enlist, but they re-enlist in larger race than whites, and they have traditionally, back in 1964, when we, before Vietnam, when we had conscription, blacks re-enlisted at a 15 percentage point higher rate than whites. Today it's only 7%, but that's one of the reasons why you have a lot of black people, because they come and they find it uh, a, a very congenial place. They find it's a, an area where they are given equal opportunity and they like it. Are we to turn around and tell them that they can't re-enlist uh, because they find it congenial? Mr. Fallows, come Let me tr try to cast this in a little bit of a different light if I could, which surprised me as a non-veteran myself from the last couple years I've spent going around to talk to people at military bases, which is from the outside of the military, we tend to discuss the problems of the volunteer force using the word quality. There's something wrong with the people who are in there. That's not the way I ever heard the problems described by the officers and the men in there. Rather, they said, it was the kind of represent representativeness issue that Phil Donahue was talking about a minute ago. In this way, they say that for the special job that soldiers have to do, which is different from any other job, you can't motivate them purely by economic incentives. You might to hire people to make cars or work in a steel factory. What it requires is a series of bonds of trust and shared sacrifice and shared respect. And they say these things are crucial between soldiers in a unit and between the whole military and the whole society. And that is why people are upset about a disproportionately black and poor white military, why the high school education figures matter, because it's not all of America being represented. And the attitude of the recruit is not positive. In other words, a person who serves the, uh, militarily is not respected. Like Rodney Dangerfield, he don't get no respect. This is what you're saying, isn't it? That's what many people told me. There was a Marine colonel who told me in Camp Pendleton, I feel like the nation's dividing up into the haves and the have-nots, and the have-nots are doing all the fighting. Let me just share one yeah, more. Let, let we'll let give you a chance. Let me just make the point. Well, I promise you. I promise you. <laughs> From more succinctly and perhaps a bit more eloquently, it is, it is uh, again, drawing from Mr. Uh, Fallow's book, Charles Peters is the uh, editor of the Washington Monthly, and here's how you quote him. In. Now, speak to this, Dr. Korb. The number one deterrent to recruitment is the nation's lack of respect for those in the services. 
until a reasonable number of people from the upper classes demonstrate their esteem by joining up themselves, the average man is going to continue to refuse to risk his life for those who would look down on him for doing so, no matter how much he is paid. This country turned its back on the military establishment during the 70s because of what went on in Vietnam. And it, thus it was not surprising that the military was not held in high, high esteem and that people who came in, people who wanted to serve, were very highly motivated and very highly qualified, got out. Nobody's talked about the fact that a lot of our problems are caused by the fact that a lot of people got out because society did not give them that respect. Young men and young women, very highly motivated people, would tell me that the reason they got out is because they were afraid to wear their uniforms in the Greyhound bus terminal, or they were afraid to, uh, to wear them in an airline terminal. Now, that has turned around, and because of that, for example, in this last year, the fiscal year we're ending, our retention rates are much higher, higher than they've been historically throughout, throughout this particular period. Now, when you talk about the, you know, the, the education level of the people, we don't expect our enlisted people to be college graduates. Our officers are, and people who come from the, the higher socioeconomic levels norm, normally sell, send their children to college, and we want to recruit them not as enlisted people, but as officers. And our officer quality today is higher than it has ever been. So it's not that these people are not there, it's just that they're officers and not enlisted as they were when we had conscription. And that's where they should be, because people who go to college should be in positions of leadership. Will Mr. Fallows please, will you make your briefest speech in behalf of your call for a peacetime uh, obligatory military draft? I think one of the plainest lessons of Vietnam was that both the military and the nation were nearly destroyed by a conflict which placed all the burden or disproportionate amount of the burden on people with the least political, economic, and social influence in the country. The volunteer force has set that in concrete in more extreme form, and that's why I think it can't go on. To make the point from your book, here's what you said. This is 1412. No one from a rich family will feel compelled to join the service just for a student loan. This speaks to the issue of we'll give them student loans and encourage them to get in. Nor will the bright kid who wins a scholarship. A service that exempts the rich, you say, Mr. Fallows, simply because of their income is still not a representative service. And I fear that the only way, you say, to have a representative army is through the draft. And you make a personal statement here. <laughs> I use the word fear, you say, because the drawbacks of compulsion are great, both philosophically and practically. I am never ego, eager, says Mr. Fallows, to see the government compel people to do anything. But the drawbacks of a volunteer force, in addition to all the purely military problems that it causes, may be worse. Let me just put it just a little bit more. Will the 18-year-old will the son of the vice president of IBM, living in Westchester, really join the army? Do we really, is it realistic to expect to have the middle and upper middle class echelons of this socially and and economically diverse society to be represented in an all-volunteer force. Yes, he will if we do two things. One thing which, you know, we, we seem to have forgotten. 1976, we, not, we discontinued the GI Bill, and a lot of the people who would have come into the military spent a few years and then gone on to college stopped coming. And that was, I think, Jim Fowler's point, that people can get aid from the federal government to go to college without uh, doing any type of service to their country. And we're going to bring back a GI Bill uh, uh, next January to get those people. And the other thing is, that the, 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 this person that you're talking about uh, uh, from this, uh, you know, from we're living in Westchester County, will join us as an officer. We, we cannot accept all the people that want to come into us today as officers. We are simply overwhelmed. Colleges want to put ROTCs back. We cannot accommodate them all. That's where we want those people, and that's where we can get them. You all can judge for yourself whether the IBM vice president's son will join. I think not, even, even given the GI Bill. Here is one other factual illustration. Of the senators and congressmen born before 1939, two-thirds of them have served on active duty in the military, mainly during World War II. Born of, when? Before 1939. 67% ahead, right, On active duty. Of those born after 1939, less than one-third have been on active duty, the reserves, or the National Guard 
the total goes down every year. What this suggests to me is an increasing cleavage between people who know anything firsthand about the military and those with education, influence, et cetera, in the country. So let's just try, we've got a break here. Uh, Dr. Korb, I think you'll at least agree with this attempted synopsis of the, of the dilemma. We I have don't a know, country. Go ahead. We have, all right, well, let's, let's see. We have a country in which it is very difficult to be elected as a public servant with, in Washington without promising more defense spending. America clearly is four square in favor of strength and in fact appears willing to spend $1.5 trillion according to the Reagan projection over the next five years to make us strong. And yet we must feel somewhat uncomfortable by the apparent hypocrisy involved in our willingness to spend for hardware and our refusal to support a, a mandatory conscription for military service and also a willingness to spend billions of dollars for military hardware as long as it is not in our own backyard. What kind of message is that to the Russians when, uh, for whom we want to appear so strong? The only message that the Russians uh, take seriously is are we combat ready? They're not concerned about the socioeconomic level. They're not concerned about where the young man or young woman comes from. They want to know can they perform their military mission. And that, I am telling you, one of the reasons that things got so bad in the last couple of years is because we refused to spend money. We became a second-class world power. Our planes couldn't fly, our ships couldn't get underway, and people who wanted to stay in got out because they were ashamed of it, and we're not going to have that anymore. We're in Salt Lake City, and we'll be back in just a moment. Here are a few things you should know about Issue 1, a plan that will raise the cost of workers' compensation. Out-of-state insurance giants want to invade Ohio, end our nonprofit tax-free system, and take the money out of Ohio for themselves. They call it old-fashioned competition. It really is old-fashioned inflation. State after state invaded by these insurance profiteers has seen the cost of their workers' comp go way up, while benefits to injured workers have been held way down. Ohio's nonprofit tax-free system is different. Costs are near the lowest, with benefits for injured workers among the best in the nation. In fact, Ohio has actually reduced the cost of workers' comp three times in the last four years. The out-of-state insurance profiteers won't only cause our injured workers to suffer, you will too. Because when Ohio business has to pay more for workers' comp, they'll be forced to pass the cost on to you with higher prices. So let's stop inflation from out-of-state and vote no on issue one. Mom, we forgot the Cane's potato chips. If your family enjoys the fresh, crisp taste of Cane's potato chips, they'll love the delicious taste of Cane's Indian corn brand corn chips, Cane's Tortico brand tortilla chips, and Cane's cheese curls. So treat your family as good as company. Bring home the all-natural goodness of Cane's. Over 25,000 people have enjoyed a banquet, cocktail party, wedding reception, or meeting in the last year at the top of the tower. Here in the River Room, we can accommodate up to 30 guests for breakfast, lunch, or dinner. For larger groups, our main room can accommodate up to 300 guests. The tower is perfect for a banquet or a theme party of your choice. If you have a special event coming up, call the top of the tower and we'll give your guests a party they'll never forget. The top of the tower also features the finest lunches in Toledo, Monday through Friday. Dr. Kerb, can you please tell us your reactions to the latest statistics released on, say, the drug abuse within the military? Obviously, we, we were upset about the fact that we do have people who use both drugs and alcohol. Interestingly enough, we, alcohol is a bigger problem, but because of the way we, we view things, we get more concerned about drugs. But don't forget, if you take a look at the population from which we draw, uh, they have a higher use, and so as long as it exists in society, we're never going to be uh, any better than, than society is. But it's not something we can rest easy with, and we're trying to take the steps that we can. Doctor, but I, do we have your agreement that this is not just an isolated problem, that the drug, alcohol, and marijuana abuse in the military services, both here and in Western Europe, is pervasive? Well, let me put it this way. It's not as bad as it was in the early part of the 70s, but we're not, any, any type of use is not acceptable to us. Uh, back to the issue that you were addressing originally, I'd like to address both of you with the fact that I don't think that forcing someone into the military or offering a volunteer service is the answer. Uh, the reason that in the 
Second World War people served is because there was a greater amount of patriotism. And what you have to look at is people's feelings about the country. What would you do about that? I think that, that what's happening now with Ronald Reagan, people are beginning to feel better about the economy, about the country, about our defense. In, uh, as a civilian for the military for about four months in the enlistment area and I worked for about 50 men and of all the people I worked with there were only about three of them who were capable of, of sustaining an intelligent conversation if we don't get the draft we're in big trouble <laughs> Uh, I am in, I, uh, President Reagan uh, should be encouraged by the support that was manifested in that last. I support President Reagan in his uh, defense uh, approach as well as his economic approach to the problems of this country. I disagree with the economic and military approaches to the problems with the Reagan is. I think we need an MX missile system. I don't think we need an MX missile system. any part of the MX missile system to be located in this state of Utah. Is this a schizophrenic audience, or is this... Uh... I think there is an important connection between the attitude towards the MX in Utah and the attitude about the draft, which I would explain the following way. If I had to bet money, I would guess that more of the MXs will be, end up being placed in Nevada than in Utah. Because, and if I also had to because, bet, because the Mormon church is located in Utah and not in Nevada. And I, I would venture that if it were the other way around, the Mormons were located in Nevada, you would see more of the missiles here. Now, uh, agree or disagree, my point is this, that it seems to me that in much of what we're talking about for defense these days, whether the MX or the draft, we're willing to do anything by way of spending money except what's difficult, whether it's putting the missiles in our backyard if we need them or drafting people. And that is my main complaint against the Reagan defense plan. What are the opportunities for women in the Army today as far as command being higher up than just on the bottom? Okay, 96% of the specialties in the military today are open to women, and the number of women in the military has increased from about 1% in 1972 to about 9% today and we expect it to continue to grow throughout the decade of the 80s. Much time. I'd like to just make a statement. I donated with pride the first five years of my marriage to a life in the military in the Second World War, and I don't feel that my government owes me anything for that time, and I'm grateful. I don't feel that uh, that we should ask our government for retirement, for things like this. That should be a gift for citizenship in this, in this land. I'd like, I'd like Mr. Fowles to address himself to the moral uh, dilemma that he finds himself in, having once resisted the draft and now suggesting that everyone else should go in the draft. Point one, to the extent we're talking about me, I've said as long as I've recommended the draft that if it were enacted, I would enlist. More important, as any parent will understand, I have two sons, and the plan I'm talking about for anybody would apply for them, to them too. Point two, we're not talking about me. We're talking about the way this country decides how to share this burden of defending itself. Point three, the experience that I and many other men of my generation went through during Vietnam is again the most obvious argument against the volunteer army, I think, because what you had wrong with the draft then and its inequities has been exaggerated and institutionalized now. 
And that is why I think we have to go back to a fairer form of military service. Let me just share, Dr. Carpenter. Yeah, well, I think it's important to keep in mind that if we, if we went back to conscription today, we would need very, very few people. The only way in which we would change what people perceive as, you know, the, uh, the, some of the unrepresentativeness of the force is to prevent people from volunteering. You've got to realize we have two million young men out there, and at the most, we would need about 100,000. And if you... Well, no matter what system you use, those people would perceive it to be unfair, and it wouldn't change things very much. Another thing to keep in mind, we have never as a nation been able to solve the question of who shall serve when all shall serve when, when not everybody serves. We've never been able to devise a system in which everybody can agree. And even now, under the present laws, we provide for exemptions for different, uh, different type of uh, conscientious objection, for example, certain medical, moral uh, uh, stands, and we would not be any better off than we are now. The, the all volunteer force is like democracy. It's, you know, people say, well, you got a lot of problems, but until you examine the alternatives, you find out it's the best way to go. And we'll be back in just a moment. You deserve a second look. Buy your first pair of prescription eyeglasses at the regular price, and you can purchase a second pair for only $8.99 from a special selection of lenses and frames. Only $8.99 for a second pair of prescription eyeglasses. You deserve a second look. And it's yours for only $8.99 at the optical department at Sears. You can trust us, you know that we care. The optical department at Sears. At Rinks, we say, yes, you can. Can you find a large selection? Yes, you can. Low, low prices in each section? Yes, you can. Japan Lucite paints are on sale this week at Rinks. With huge savings on Lucite latex wall paint, priced at only $8.88 a gallon. Or Lucite Latex Semi-Gloss Interior Enamel, priced at only $12.99 a gallon. Can you buy nationally famous paints at fantastic savings? When you shop at Rinks, yes, you can. Yes, you can. Banner Mattress is having an inventory clearance sale. At the same time, Banner Mattress is having a remodeling sale. It's two sales at once. Banner Mattresses put their best-selling merchandise at 20 to 30% off. With everything on sale at both stores, you save 5 to 68%. This peacock chair for only $29. Nightstands for as low as $19. Headboards for only $5. This indestructible bunk bed for only $59. Plus, every Banner mattress and box spring is on sale at fantastic savings. Go first class for less at Banner Mattress. Ken Shaw presents Engelbert, live on stage at the Toledo Masonic Auditorium. Engelbert Humperdinck returns to Toledo with two all-new Las Vegas performances Wednesday, October 14th at 7 and 10 p.m. Don't miss Engelbert Wednesday, October 14th. Charge tickets, phone 381-8851. WLQR, Stereo 101. We believe Highland House is the finest, most honest value to be found. Timeless styling from stately elegant to deeply comfortable casual. Eye-pleasing mirror-matched perfect tailoring. Unique and tasteful fabric application from hundreds of better fabrics. Add the comfort and long life of hand-tied coil construction, and you have the Highland House Gallery. Choose from our pre-planned stock or custom order with the help of our design specialists. Best of all, Highland House sofas can be found from $598 to $1,000. The Highland House Gallery, outstanding value at Walker Furniture. A frost warning for tonight, the forecast on the noon report. Uh, he has some uh, observations to make about this country's uh, military emphasis on hardware. And we'll give him an opportunity to do that, and Dr. Uh, we'll give Dr. Corb a chance to respond. But first, I want you to see some of the latest commercials that are being used to encourage young men to join the volunteer force. After all, television being this tremendously influential medium that it is, the best way to get to the potential recruit is through this instrument that we call TV, and here's one example of how they're doing it. Roll, spot. There's a hungry kind of feeling, and every day it grows. You know there's so much more to you. 
than anybody knows. Specialist Kevin Crowley is working with tomorrow's technology in the Army's newest tank. The laser determines target range and feeds it into the computer. Imagine 60 tons of steel moving at 45 miles an hour. It's incredible. In a book titled National Defense, James Fallows has a good deal to say. Here's a copy of Same. Uh, having seen that commercial now, Mr. Fallows, what, are your, what is it that you said in your book, and is it germane to what we just saw? To put the point briefly, one of the main trends I try to discuss in this book is the progression towards weapons that are of higher and higher technical complexity, such as the uh, new tank they're talking about there with its laser guidance systems. Now, in theory, these weapons, whether they're tanks or submarines or fighter planes or missiles or whatever, are all dramatic breakthroughs over the equipment we've had before. What you can also see, though, is they have become more expensive giving us smaller and smaller forces. They are harder to maintain, meaning you have planes you can't fly and tanks that break down, and they often are unsuited to the real chaotic circumstances of typified real combat. So there's an argument that many serious people in uniform are making about whether we should push the balance back in the direction of large numbers of, of simpler and more reliable and less expensive things. What's your point about the F-16? The F-16 was a fighter plane that was designed to have some of these, these virtues of simplicity and greater numbers. At the end of the development process, which I describe in the book, it got loaded down with a couple extra tons of electronic equipment, literally tons, which, which added very little to its capability and degraded certain other parts. And it's been grounded in some places? It has. It's uh, because of a uh, computer screw-up at the moment. And how do you feel about a, a missile submarine that carries 24 of the highly advanced uh, Trident, or, or is it Poseidon uh, missile? These will, will be Trident missiles. This is the new Trident submarine, which someday should go into service carrying nuclear missiles. Now, from an economist's point of view, this is a real bargain in efficiency, because each submarine carries uh, 24 missiles instead of 16 from the previous variety. But if you think that our nuclear deterrent under the sea is going from a force of 41 smaller submarines to 10 or 12 or 15 of these larger ones, you wonder if we're any better off because we have more of our eggs in this very much smaller number of baskets. And you anticipate the possibility of the Russians being able to electronically locate these submarines? If they were able to, then if we lost one, we'd be losing a much larger share of our security than if we have a whole lot of them. And why does it this way, in your view? What's your analysis say about that? How come we got this inefficient? This was, there are many reasons. The main one was a view of efficiency that matches most of the civilian world but not the special imperatives of the military world. And the larger point I tried to make is that when you view military equipment or military morale or anything else from standards you might apply from business or academia or other things, you may often get into situations like that. Yes. Uh, I believe that Mr. Fallon will, won't have, a, I agree with him thoroughly, and I believe that uh, he is completely right, and the other fellow don't ha have to worry either because there'll be a lot of people join the army with the Reaganomics that will happen in the few next few years. The young won't be able to eat and you'll have little old ladies and little old men that uh, the Social Security benefits, they'll have to join too. And the women will have to join. Let me make a comment about that. I, I can't leave that go by. Last year, at this time, unemployment was higher than it is now, and we were getting the people that Jim talked about in, this, in his book. This year, with unemployment low, in other words, the economy is better this year than it was last, not where it should be, we are getting twice as many high school graduates. It's what that lady said over there. It's the spirit that President Reagan has communicated to the country. He's our best recruiter. I'd like to... I'd like to know what individuals decide who goes first on the draft. Uh, if, if he were to have a draft, tell us about your exemptions. And doesn't Dr. Korb have a point? Once you start a draft, suddenly you've got a million 18-year-olds out there with a backache, a heart murmur. They've got uh, migraines. And also the wealthy fathers who play golf at the country club with the doctors will get a deferment for these guys. And once again, we're into it. It's precisely because of that, and the record in which 
all those things were, were exaggerated and abused during the Vietnam War, that I think the first tenet of any draft is that it have no exemptions. Except, you know, if, if people are handicapped in the normal common sense meaning of that term, you know, if they're a paraplegic or something, they could have an exemption from the draft. I think beyond that, it should be, there should be no exemptions. And if, as Larry Corb is saying, there's a shortage, you don't need all the people who are a certain age, well, then you can find various fair ways such as a lottery to get them. But in general, people would have to go without an exemption. If but Jim, you're defying history. We've never been able to do that. And even the present law under the lottery system allows it for conscientious objection. And it allows people who are, for example, ministers of certain religions, certain moral uh, type of things people will not be accepted into the armed services for. And so no matter how you do it, you're going to leave those loopholes. And as Phil said, it'll be precisely the people you want to get in who will know how to take advantage of them. My question is, uh, I concede his point about the 10 submarines versus the two, but how are we supposed to keep up with the arms race with the Soviet Union with their so, uh, sophisticated equipment? The diagnosis you hear is the greatest threat the Soviet Union poses, including in the booklet that Secretary Weinberger, Weinberger put out yesterday, is the greater numbers of equipment they have in almost everything. They have more submarines, more ships, more tanks, et cetera, et cetera. If that is the problem, does it make sense for us to continue down a path in which we build smaller and smaller numbers of things every year, which is what we're doing? I we think were doing under President Carter, but right now we're buying more of the things and we're coming to a balance between technological uh, sophistication and numbers. Previously, we just weren't spending the money on defense, so we could only afford to buy a few of them. And we'll be back in just a moment. How do you open tight jar lids? On your counter? With a towel? A knife? Perhaps hot water? Ouch! Well, never again with Top Loose, the jar lid loosener that opens small lids with a slight twist. Medium lids are a cinch, and it's easy to use. Extra large lids are a snap, and it always works. Top Loose for tough-to-open jar lids. Look for this display. Top Loose jar lid loosener is now available at Kmart and Kroger. 20% off entire stock for three days only at Maddie's Papagallo and Mommy and the shop for Papagallo in Toledo. Everything that's Papagallo perfect will be 20% off Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. You can stock up now on great wardrobe classics like Robert Scott, Braemar, J.G. Hook, David Brooks, and Thompson. And of course, those great Papagallo shoes. Hurry in while we still have your size. That's Maddie's Papagallo on West Wayne Street in Maumee and the shop for Papagallo in Toledo. Three days only, 20% off entire stock. The return to elegance. Johnson's Fine Furniture is pleased to present new designs from Pennsylvania House at 20% savings. Authentic traditional 18th century designs are exquisitely crafted with a rich new finish in this fine cherry collection. Elegant bedrooms are crafted with fluted posts, inlaid moldings of olive, ash, burl, and hardware faithful to the period. Details such as shell carving and cabriole legs add grace and charm for any room. Pennsylvania House, now at savings of 20% at Johnson's Fine Furniture, Sylvania Douglas. Construction work caused massive traffic jams for miles of downtown Toledo, and Contact 13 came to the rescue. Stronger. Within hours, Jim Roots had talked to all the folks involved and got some relief for motorists. Whether it's a small consumer problem or a massive traffic jam, Contact 13. 13 strong, stronger every day. Rather than a draft, wouldn't it be better to strengthen the reserves and have the people... Well, have the people in the reserves that do nothing one weekend a month do something. Make that's them right, stronger. and that's what we're doing. We, we weren't spending any money on them to allow them to do anything, and we've increased the amount of money going to the reserves. Yes. We've added 100,000 people in the last year to the selected reserve. I just wanted to make the comment that it really bothers me, and it's no wonder that people or the men don't join the service when they see the glamour that football players can get going to college, the money they can make. And it's the condition of the Vietnam veterans after they went and risked their New York. You know, 
Uh, yeah. What I'm worried about in your peacetime draft is that you will take away the freedom of choice from the males of our society to fight for a country whose major premise is freedom of choice. A, a brief answer to that. There are no doubt conscription is an encroachment on liberty. So are taxes. And there are certain basic sacrifices that we either make or we don't to keep the place going. How can we be sure you'd serve now if you were drafted when you wouldn't serve before? Yes. Here I am on TV saying it. Yes. I have three sons, and although I, I'm for the draft, although I really wouldn't want them to be killed, I think it's necessary for our young men to do this when we need it. have a little boy who I just worship the ground he walks on, but I want to ask the young gentleman, how does he feel when he stands up to sing God Bless America? You feel good? I feel good. How do you feel? I mean, I, I mean that... Sir. Yes. Well, I think the implication of the question... How about they want to know... Well, the courts have decided that, that particular question for us, uh, but I think the courts are wrong. The question, is, the question is, how about, would, would the draft, the, would the fellows draft include women? I think it would have to. I'd just, I'd just like to know. If there is going to be a draft, peacetime or wartime, then I believe that it should be a draft that obliges only men to serve. If there's a peacetime or military draft, I think both sexes should be equally obliged. I'd like to know if the MX missiles and the nerve bombs are going to be based here in Utah and Nevada, what are our chances of being hit first if a war breaks out? Do you know? I think the main problem with this country They've lost all respect for their country. Yeah, I like your dress. They missed our section. Uh, Mr. Fellows uh, addressed the point that this, this region was objecting to have MX based here, but we wouldn't mind having it based someplace else. Uh, I think that's a misnomer. I think what the church, not only the region, but the church is opposed to the MX plan, but we for years have, have been more than willing to have our share of missiles or whatever based here in this region. So what kind of missile will you accept? Well, I would say that, that I'm not... Can we, can we put Titans out here? That's fine. Can you put Minutemen? You bet. But you can't put the uh, MX. The MX is a white elephant that by the time it's completed, it'll be obsolete. And we'll... right, let's get this straight now. Hold it. Hold it. We're almost out of time. We're almost out of time. Give me a chance to try and understand this. So the Mormon church's objection to the MX missile system is not the potential damage to the environment, not the, po not the influx of, of people from out of state who will move into a, a wonderfully... A, a wonderfully um, peaceful place to live. It is the efficiency and your projection of the fact that the MX isn't going to work. Oh, I... I, I Why don't really you take that. President Reagan's word Did for you it? There? You support him in every other way. Isn't he entitled to have you accept he his... He hasn't accepted the MX yet. He's still deciding. I, but by the time this airs, in most places in the country, we will know where he plans to base it. So there's no controversy about the president's conviction that this thing is going to work. You support him. He has overwhelming support for his policies here. And yet, for some, some reason, you step forward to say, I don't think you're right, Mr. President, on your anticipated... Uh... Okay. Well, I'm addressing your comment to the area, and Mr. Fellows as well. It made us appear that we were all for MX, but we were opposed to having it in our backyard. It does look you, that way, yeah. Okay. You That's not true. We are, we, the, this area has been the target of nuclear weaponry for decades. And in fact... <laughs> Who knows how long? And, and yet, if you take an honest poll of how many people would support some sort of system based right here, you would find that the majority would support it. How many will take in here in Utah more Titan and Minuteman missiles here? How many, how many don't want any more holes in the ground here for military purposes? That seems to deny what you're saying. 
I don't think so. And I think if you read the church's stand in the news media, that they made it very clear. Right. And we'll be back in just a moment. <laughs> This is our noodle soup, Mrs. Grass. This is their noodle soup, and they're in for a little trouble. First, we're giving them a knock to the noodles. Our noodles are bigger, and there's 50% more of them. Then it's a blow to the broth. We've come up with a golden nugget filled with rich chickeny flavor. When people taste Mrs. Grass noodle soup, mmm, lift it, watch out. Good just isn't good enough for Mrs. Grass. Joanne's Ladybug presents Elaine with the look for Fall 81. Whatever the occasion, whatever your style, Joanne can put it all together for you. The news at Joanne's this fall is Papagallo. Joanne's has a full line of Papagallo shoes and accessories. You can personalize your purchase from Joanne's with a monogram done right in the shop. A very special occasion begins with the personal attention you'll get in picking out the perfect dress at Joanne's. Wouldn't you love to look like this? And it's all waiting for you at Joanne's Ladybug, Courtyard Square, Bowling Green. It's Macy's store-wide anniversary sale with some of the best savings of the season for you. Save on Mrs. Blouses. Sportswear. Monogram sweaters. Coats. Save on men's Robert Bruce sweaters. Levi's and Ferris slacks. Save on sofas. And chairs. RCA, Sony, GE, and Panasonic TVs. There's much more on sale, so save now during Macy's store-wide anniversary sale. At Macy's, we're a part of your life. October is Unique Month at Bedland, and Bedland is putting their complete line of unique, quality-crafted furniture on sale. This exquisite all-wood furniture is available in French provincial, contemporary, and traditional styling. For years, Bedland has specialized in the finest bedroom furniture and accessories from America's leading manufacturers. When you're looking for quality and durability in bedroom furniture, make Bedland at 2544 North Reynolds Road your first stop. Your bedroom is our only business. If you would like a written transcript of today's program, send $2.50 in check or money order to Donahue Transcripts, Box 2111, Cincinnati, Ohio, 45201. Include the subject or the name of the guest with your request. All right. Mr. Fallow's book is titled National Defense. Thanks also to Dr. Korb. Both proud Americans, I think we can say that, who are serving uh, their country in each in uh, different ways. And we want you to know we're grateful for your appearance here with very little time left. One-liners from the audience. Uh, I'm for the draft, but Dr. Uh, uh, Mr. Fowler, you're the wrong person to go for the draft. You made, uh, with your not going to war, the young people are now going to be able to make a decision whether they like the war or not, and they will not be drafted. I assume you would preserve the freedom to decline to serve on conscience, would you? And to have alternate service for those who profoundly object. I'm just wondering why the Army doesn't uh, let some of the men know more about their educational benefits that they can take advantage of while they're in the service. We're doing that, and we're going to have better uh, educational benefits as we go. Over here. All right, I'd like to know from the audience, who's going to trust their lives in the hand of a man who can't even read the name of the gun? Uh, who can? Well, because the education and the drugs and the s services is getting so... Stingy. That's because we turned our backs on them, and when we've come around now, we've improved it. We have higher quality people this year come in than even when we had conscription. Services provided and promotional fees paid by the following. Hotel Utah, Salt Lake City's only grand luxury class hotel, a preferred association hotel, home of Donahue staff and guests while in Salt Lake. American Airlines, from Hawaii to the Caribbean, from Canada to Mexico, with over 70 great American cities in between. Let American Airlines show you what they do best. Just call your travel agent or American Airlines. The new Volvo GLT Turbo. Our engineers love it for sound engineering reasons. Our test drivers just love it. Another lap. Super scrubbable, true test, easy care, latex, flat wall and trim finish. Perfect for both walls and woodwork sold only by True Value Hardware Stores and Home Centers.
talking with us. We continue the nightly news from NBC, and we'll see you at 11.